We're going to go through a few different things this morning for a soul winning school and we're going to operate under the assumption that you already have a soul winning plan, that you have your presentation down. Now if you're still a, a new soul winner, we do have uh, the complete presentation printed out on the back over there, so get one on the way out if you need one. It is the presentation that Pastor Romero uses. It is, uh, it's a two-sided piece. I had to shrink the font a little bit, but um, you can kind of run through and see how, how Pastor Romero does it. His presentation also is available online if you are not familiar with it. If you, you can actually use this sheet and go along with his presentation to get an idea of the illustrations and everything else. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that, that we should give diligence to add to our faith. And I believe as soul winners, it's our responsibility to get better at soul winning. I believe it's something that, you know, I've met a lot of soul winners and gospel preachers over the years. And there's a lot of people that start out very basic. But I believe it's our responsibility to add to our faith. And I don't mean just add to your presentation so it gets so bloated that you kind of get off track. You know, that's not good. But I do believe that we need to sharpen our skills. We need to get better at memorizing the scriptures, committing them to memory, and also having an answer when somebody has an objection. The Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved. And the only way you're going to do that is to study. There's a few elements to soul winning that are very basic. One is, you know, you should be in prayer about it. Um, another is that you need to be studied about it. You know, and, the, and, the, and another would be, you know, another aspect is that you're living righteously and then the Holy Spirit's going to work more through you. Now we're really going to be talking about the studying aspect, the things you can study, illustrations you can use, and just some real basic um, methods of operation. I believe your soul winning plan should be a framework. You look at the windows over here, you know, there's several windows. If a rock was thrown through one window, the entire structure would not fall. And if you have a framework to your soul winning presentation, and you get messed up or they take you off track, you're not going to get so far down a rabbit trail that you leave out that it's by faith alone or that you leave out that it's everlasting life. So having a framework to your soul winning presentation is very important. It's something where you can gauge for yourself where you're at and you know where you're going. It's something that you don't have to worry if somebody gets you off track. You can, you, I'm gonna show you how to deal with those situations and then to get back where you need to go. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs 26 if you would. So I want to show you a framework for success. And again, it begins with a very solid, basic presentation. You know, um, there's, there's four things you have to know to go to heaven. You know, what, whatever method that you use, you know, stick with that. It's very important not to be wavering. However, every gospel presentation is going to be slightly different because the person is different, but the points that you make need to be consistent. The verses that you use should be consistent. This should be a repeatable structure. Structure, not just, well, I don't know, let's see where we go today. Hey, here we, we need to go to Exodus. Wait, what? Don't, get to, don't go so far off track, you know? And talking with people, a lot of times, you will end up going down rabbit trails, and this is something you have to be cautious of. You want to use the same illustrations, and it's okay to listen to somebody else's presentation online. In fact, I, re I recommend that. You should listen to Pastor Anderson, Pastor Berzins, Pastor Jimenez, Pastor Boyle, Pastor Romero. Listen to these guys that have been doing it for years and years. Listen to the methods that they're using. Uh, Brother Bruce Mejia has a good one. There's a lot of these guys where you can listen to what they have and you might say, oh, well, that's different how he did that. Doesn't, different doesn't mean wrong. And, there's, and sometimes you, know, a, a, you may find that what somebody else does is better for your personality. The, the thing is, though, you don't want to keep adding it. I used to joke about, you know, that's like if you saved every single bulletin every week, your Bible would get so fat it'd take two hands to carry it, you know. That's not really how your gospel presentation ought to be. There are certain things that have to be there, that must be there, and there are certain things that may be there. An example is that Jesus is God. That must be in your soul winning presentation. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can raise the dead. All right? And, you know, other people may throw the Trinity in where it's not really fitting. You know, I, I've seen somebody, well, is Jesus, is Jesus the Father? Well, to an unsafe person, they don't understand what they're asking. Listen, that is an issue, and personally, in my soul winning presentation, I use 
uh, 1 John 5, 7, as explaining the Godhead in that Jesus is God, I'm also teaching the Trinity. But it, it's not, I don't spend 10 minutes trying to teach the Trinity. I use the simplicity of the Trinity to teach the Godhead that Jesus is God. We have some stickers in the back also. These stickers are really great. It's kind of like a cheat sheet. Feel free to pull one off and put it in the back of your Bible. Um, I, I separate it by Jesus is God. What's a few great verses for that? Matthew 1, 23. Acts 7.59. I use that in every presentation. Acts 7.59. Calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And I point at the name Jesus and I say, what name did he call God? And I'd be quiet. And I wait for them to say Jesus. Listen, in your soul winning presentation, it's important to understand when you need to be quiet, when you need to listen. A lot of the things that you're going to deal with, you're going to foreshadow a point that you may tell in the future. For instance, you don't have to hide the fact that it's by faith alone until you get into the second half of your presentation. You can actually say that before you get in your presentation. It's not necessary, but you can. You can foreshadow that we're going to be talking about how it is faith alone. Um, personally, in my presentation, when I'm introducing the concept of the punishment for sin, the Bible teaches death and hell, right? The lake of fire, the second death. The wages of sin is death and hell. And I get the person I'm speaking to to repeat that back to me several times throughout my presentation. And what was the punishment for sin? And they may say death, and I'll say and, and I get them to say hell. I try to get feedback from the people. I don't want to just tell them. I want them to say it. I want them to understand it. The reason I, I personally use death and hell, because that's what the Bible says. Everybody knows that Jesus died for our sins, but the punishment for our sins is hell. And there's like a disconnect in their mind. Hey, the punishment for our sins is death and hell. And hey, guess what? Jesus died and went to hell for our sins. And later, I show that when I teach the resurrection. I help them understand that truth. So I do foreshadowing, letting them know that we're going to be talking about death and hell throughout and that I expect them to remember that. I mention it several times. It's not a big reveal. You know, some... Some preachers have this mentality that they're going, their intro should be 10 or 15 minutes, and then they get to this big aha moment. Aha! Do you see that verse? Whereas I believe, and I teach our, our, our men that preach here, that you should tell them in the beginning what you're going to say, even if it's a big, well, it's, that's a bold statement from the beginning, but hey, I'm going to prove it from the Bible. Because sometimes people get lost waiting for that big reveal. So use foreshadowing to let people know it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. It is everlasting life how long does everlasting life last for you know you can ask these questions throughout even before you get very serious and deep about the fact that it lasts forever eternal security once saved always saved you can foreshadow those points and by the time you get there you know you're building a house brick by brick line upon line you don't put the roof on without the foundation and a lot of times soul winners will get frazzled because they don't have the the framework of having a solid presentation, a solid core of verses. And listen, there are soul winners that that's all they have is 10 verses and their attitude is such that I, I'm afraid to do wrong and I want to get better and please help me learn. God rewards that attitude and God will send you the people that you can handle so long as you're learning. But I have met other soul winners that later you find out they were actually unsaved. Well, they're listening and they're repeating what somebody else has said, but they don't believe it in their heart. Listen, this is a real problem, right? We're, it, it doesn't matter. The numbers are not why we're here. The numbers are just a way to gauge what we're doing. And some people that come back and they say, well, I, I got a dozen people saved today and everybody else got one. <laughs> uh, something's off. So I'm a little bit worried about that. That should not be, right? And you have to gauge, because if people are just saying, you hear this verse? Yes, you hear this verse? Okay, now pray with me. That's not salvation. That's right. Listen, we are opposed to one, two, three, repeat after me. Right. People have to understand Amen. what they're learning. They have to be able to, con to, to, to repeat it back. They have to be able, you can, you know, I, I always try to, I say I talk them out of it. I try to talk them out of their, their soul winning. And what I mean is, you know, first of all, you know, you go to the door and 90% of the people would already claim to be a Christian. Well, guess what? They're not. Right. And you have to talk them out of it. Then you give them the truth and then you talk them out of it again to test them to see whether or not they believe it. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things when you first go up, I, I believe it's very important to understand, this is the gospel of peace, right? We're going out as 
peacemakers. There's a blessing for being a peacemaker. We should go out, we should have a very friendly introduction, right? Personally, what I will do is I'll hold my Bible and my invite in one hand and with an open hand and a big smile, I, I talk to them. Listen, this is very important because this is showing you're harmless. I want you to, and people don't really think about their body language sometimes. And you imagine, I want you to imagine if somebody came to the door and they're kind of, <laughs> what do you, hey, are you in, you go to church anywhere? You know, who wants to talk to somebody like that? You should have an open palm literally to show you're harmless, right? This is body language that's universal. I'm unarmed. You're not, you know, hey, maybe you are armed. That's okay. But still have an open, open hand. I know some of our guys carry while they go out and, you know, for good reason. But hey, um, you need to be relaxed, right? You need to be harmless as doves. You need to go to the door with the attitude that if, that if they just yell at you, you just smile and keep going. Right? If you had the numbers figured out and you knew for a fact, okay, every 10 people I talk to, one will listen, so I will have nine no's, then go out with that attitude, all right, I'm going to find my no's, I'm going to get them out of the way. So when somebody's rude, I just smile and say, okay, thanks for not wasting my time, I'll go to your neighbor, because they probably want to hear it. They are probably asking the Lord how to be saved, and if I stop and argue with you, I'm wasting time. One of the most important things that I've noticed that, that new soul winners overlook is what I call a tie down. A tie down. I want to know where you stand because I'm going to have to reference it later. Um, hi, my name's Adam. I'm a step Baptist church. Y'all go to church anywhere? The next, well, yes, no, maybe. We go over here. Okay, great. Well, more important than going to church, are you 100% sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven? And I use hand gestures. I, what do you, you know, you think, or heaven, you know, point to the things, help them connect the dots. And, well, yeah, I think so. Oh, I'm pretty sure. The one, my most favorite was, oh, yeah, 100% sure. Okay, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, how, what in the world? You know what I mean? Most people will say, well, I don't know. Can you really be sure? No one can be sure. They'll say, yeah, I think so. But whatever they say there, it doesn't really matter. You're always going to use the next question, and this is very important. In your opinion, what do you think someone has to do to go to heaven? And if somebody starts saying uh, sanctification of the, you know, like, well, I don't, I'm not looking for theological terms. Just in your words, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Oh, well, you know, just believe. Now that sounds like the right answer. But listen, for a tie down to get the information you need, what I do is I repeat what they say. Just believe. And they'll say, yep, just believe and be baptized and keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. You start out right, okay? If they don't say that, if they say, just believe, it's all by faith. Is there anything else? No, I don't think so. Is there anything you think you could do that would cause you to lose your salvation? Oh, yeah, all sorts of things. I hear that one a lot. It sounds like they're believing faith alone, but when it comes to eternal security, one saved always, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, man, all manner of things. Like what? Like, give me an example. Oh, well, like adultery, okay. What about lying? Yeah, maybe, you know. What about murder? Oh, of course, of course. You can't murder somebody and still go to heaven. So what you're doing is, whenever they say these things, for instance, if I, just back up, start. So what do you think you have to do, in your own opinion, to go to heaven? Well, I think you have to be a good person, right? What then I would do is repeat that to them and just nod your head, say, be a good person. And they will then explain themselves what they mean by be a good person. They'll say, yeah, you can't just live however you want. Or the, well, you have to go to church, right? You can't keep living in sin. And when they say, okay, you can't keep living in sin. Well, no, of course, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. So what they're going to do is they're actually digging deeper. Yeah. They're giving you rope to hang them. And I call this a tie-down because I want to hear what's really in your heart. It's by your words you'll be justified, or by your words you will be condemned. And if you give them the opportunity, they will tell on themselves. And the majority of Christians that you meet at the door will end up giving you the wrong answer. They're going to tell you one way or another they're trusting in their own works. But if you overlook this step and you don't have this information, when you get to the end of your presentation, they may say, well, I've always believed that. <laughs> right? They're going to add to what they've already had. They'll go along to get along rather than being clear, yeah, that is different. Okay? And look, I do believe it's very important with word definitions. 
Because when I say baptism, I think one thing. When I talk to a Mormon, he thinks something different. When I talk to a Catholic, they're thinking something drastically different. Hey, even even uh, an Orthodox, you know, oh yeah, we got to splash the baby. Th like, that's not baptism, right? We think different things with words. So it's very important to learn the person you're with and define the words that you think are important. When they use certain words, you may want to, you know, like I said, repeat that, but, you know, ask it like, like a Christian. There are people that think they're a Christian, and by saying Christian, they simply mean, well, I'm not a Muslim, right? But when we say Christian, we mean a born-again, Bible-believing, you know, saved Christian, whereas they just simply mean, like, it's a political status. Well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm not a Democrat. You know, well, those are different, you know? We have to break through the definitions, and you have to, you know, be in prayer that the Lord would help you be aware of what words need to be defined and, and how to break through that. Um, so if they, if they don't give you anything that sounds wrong while you're trying to get this tie down, so what do you think you have to do? Just believe. Okay, just believe. Yep. Anything else? Mm, nope. If, the, if they don't have anything that you can hang them by to say they're not saved, then you would make a recommendation. Okay, what about baptism? Do you think you have to be baptized? No. Okay. Do you think you have to go to church? No. Do you think it's necessary to keep the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah. Okay, there, I got you, right? Now, listen, you're going to find people that really are saved that are living in sin, and, and there's a way to handle them. You know, you provoke them to jealousy. You challenge them that if they want God's blessing on their life, they should be obedient. They should be in church. They should be preaching the gospel. But the majority of the people you talk to are unsaved, and they're sort of hiding it. So it's very important to ask these questions so you can point back to it later. When you get to the end of your presentation and you say, see what you said before was you had to be baptized and go to church. Do you see how this is different? Otherwise, you have nothing to say. You just say, see, do you see that? Do you want to pray? And they're like, pray for what? I've already believed all that. So it's very important to get that tie down. It's something you can pin them down on, mark it down and say, I know they said they're trusting in baptism. I know I have to deal with that. I know I have to show them it's not by their own works. Um, I mentioned earlier about being silent, knowing when to be silent. Now, in your introduction, when you ask certain questions, if you keep talking, they're not going to answer. This is very important to understand. What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? You know, what's your opinion? What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? I mean, do you think you have... Whoa, they didn't get a chance, right? What you should do is just be quiet, look them in the eyes, smile, and wait for them to talk. Yes, it may be awkward silence, but this is very, very important, not just in your introduction, but all throughout. Listen, your soul winning presentation should not just be reading a verse and saying, do you agree with that? And then they say yes. That's not the kind of questions you need to be asking. Some things are simple and basic. You just get a yes. Most things you need to get some sort of verbal recognition from them that they do comprehend what you're saying. You have to define the verses for them. Preaching isn't just reading the Bible. It's reading the Bible and explaining what it means. Soul winning is the same thing. Soul winning is preaching. And you have to know when to be quiet and let them speak for themselves. If you give them the answer, then you don't actually know what they believe. It's very important. You also have to be ready to exit. You, all, you have to have an exit plan. Last weekend, we're soul winning, talking to this young lady. And it's like she gets some things and then she doesn't and then there's a kid that's a distraction and then something else happens and i'm just fine you know do you really want to hear this right now um i'm kind of busy okay all right we'll see you later and listen that's what that's what your invitation that's what your youtube card is for sometimes it's not just a conversation starter it's a conversation ender you can end the conversation and say, well, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go online. You see this highlighted video. It says the Bible way to heaven. It's seven minutes. And if you watch that, it tells you everything you need to know to make sure you go to heaven when you die. Have a great day. Walk away. Be ready to walk away. Your time is valuable. You are giving out the most precious gift in the world, and it's free. And look, you can't force feed a baby, and you can't twist somebody's arm and make them hear the gospel. If they don't want to listen, they're not going to listen. And you have to consider the neighbor, the next door. The devil is going to put stumbling blocks in your way. He's going to put distractions to keep you from being a successful soul winner. Yeah. And sometimes it's a very pleasant person yeah. 
that has questions that's not really listening and you need to have an exit plan you need to be ready to walk away from them listen when you go out preaching you're going out in authority God has given you the authority and the responsibility and a ministry to preach to people whenever I'm at the door and there's a radio or a TV on hey can you can you just turn that off for a minute that's kind of distracting right or there's people behind them that are yelling and mocking whatever hey why don't you just step outside for a minute okay let's just you need to hear this this is very important let them know how important it is and you know we need to be persuasive but there is a fine line of being pushy okay if you're pushy then somebody will sit there and listen and all they're thinking is when is this guy going to be done what do i have to do to shut him up pray yeah i'll pray i'll pray whatever you want if you'll leave me alone listen we are commanded to be persuasive we are supposed to persuade people to not only go to church but to hear the gospel you know sometimes you'll run across people that initially they say they don't have any time right don't say well, it only take five minutes don't say that if it takes five minutes I'm worried about you all right <laughs> it should take 20 minutes 30 minutes 40 minutes to give an effective presentation Amen. so don't tell them it's just going to be very short and quick but tell them that it is the most important thing they'll ever hear this is so important you can know right now for sure you can make an educated decision how can you decide if you haven't heard you know so you should compel them and persuade them to listen but there's a fine line don't be pushy because you don't want to back some, a mousy person into a corner so they listen they're gonna feel like they're being bullied if they don't want to hear it walk away right, right? they're not gonna receive it. you can't force somebody to receive that and I think it's also very important to have separation to separate yourself from the people that you're talking to what do you think you have to do to go to heaven okay well the Bible says something a little different listen I don't apologize for telling people that they may go to hell it is the truth now look I don't do it rudely either if it's a you know the Bible talks about being becoming all all things to all men right when it's a little old lady I am as proper and respectful as I can be and yet there have been men on the side of the road they're like bikers that look all tatted out and rough hey let me ask you something if you die right now are you going to hell or are you going to heaven I'm not afraid to be bold because I'm going out with authority I have nothing to fear but it's my responsibility to talk to that person and I've had men that actually respect the fact that I don't come up like some mousy Bible nerd oh excuse me sir um if you were you know no hey excuse, hey man let me talk to you for a second <laughs> you know use the authority that God has given you but also stay separate all right stay separate I saw a guy one time and he thought he would become all things all men so he thought he'd just smoke a cigarette with the guy <laughs> are you kidding me look smoking won't send you to hell but we're out there to be witnesses of Jesus yeah hey man Jesus was pretty cool you know like come on listen separate yourself from them don't be afraid to tell them what what you believe is wrong Hey, you know, the Bible says something a little bit different. Can I show you what it says? Most people are not offended at that. If they get offended at that point and you've made it this far, you're not going to be able to finish anyway. Right? This may be your exit. Well, I believe what I want. You can't just live however. Well. Yeah, you, you once saved, always saved. I, okay, later. <laughs> Thank you. You just saved me some time. So, again, always be looking for that exit out of respect for your own time. Value your own time. Your gift that God has given us to give away is so precious and to waste it on somebody that's going to scoff throughout the whole presentation is not giving it to the neighbor is the way I look at it yeah. but that separation you know um, we had a lady recently that started saying you know she's she's spouting off all this Pentecostal stuff and you got to do the works you know I mean it says shall we continue in sin now well it does say that you want to nod the head and say well yes the Bible says that but how she's using it is not right okay well Paul, actually, no, ma'am, you're wrong. You're saying you don't believe the Bible? No, I'm saying you don't understand the Bible. Like, there, there, with the authority you're given, you should separate yourself. You don't cross the threshold. You think about it. If there's a door here, and they're on that side, you're on this side, they're unsaved, and they know Scripture, you don't put yourself on this side and say, well, you, you're using that verse. Yeah, it says that verse. You need to be clear. You need to have the authority that God has given you and take control of the situation. Pardon me, ma'am, but that's wrong. You know, hey, then I might forgive, ask for forgiveness as I get a little bolder. Well, sorry for saying it, ma'am, but you're wrong. The Bible says it's by faith alone. You're saying it's by works. There is a difference. Can I show you? No, you can't tell. Okay, good. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. 
So listen, you need to keep that separation, first of all, by telling them initially they're wrong, but also during your presentation, do not go over to their side if they're unsaved, because then you're comforting them and, and, and strengthening them in their error. You need to correct the error. It's very important. I look at soul winning in general as troubleshooting. As troubleshooting, right? As a computer nerd for years, there's always, whether it be, you know, software or a website or a video or working on a computer, I, I start with, okay, is there power? Well, is it connected here? Is it connected there? Is the hard drive work? How about the RAM? So I begin a, like a flow chart of troubleshooting what's wrong with a device or software. And in the same way, that's what we do with people, essentially. And you know, even if you may say, well, I'm not a computer nerd, I'm not a, under, you know, know what you mean. You know, I wanna know, are you saved? Are you really saved? You say you're a Christian, let me ask these questions and find out if they're saved. I find out the answer is no. I tell them they're wrong, I proceed with my presentation. Are they understanding the presentation? I am troubleshooting throughout the entire presentation. I'll ask, do you understand? But more importantly, I'll use illustrations to make sure that they understand. Well, what about, let's say you have a good guy and a bad guy. And the good guy, you know, he takes care of his family, he goes to church, he pays his tithe, he feeds the poor, but in his heart, he believes he's good enough to get into heaven. When he dies, where will he go? Now, if they say, well, he does good works. If they're paying attention, they get it, they'll say, well, obviously, he goes to hell. Yeah. The flip side of the coin, well, you got a bad guy. Let's say he doesn't take care of his family. I mean, let's say the guy does things he shouldn't do. I mean, what if he cusses and drinks? But in his heart, he knows that Jesus died for all of his sins, and that's what he's trusting in. When he dies, where will he go? And if they say, well, he'd go to hell too, then guess what? You failed. Right? The illustrations are to gauge where you're at, how much understanding they have. And the illustrations help you to define the words and the, the verses that you give them. It's very, you know, so I want to know if they're saved. Then I want to see if they're understanding. And then when I get to the point where I feel comfortable, like they're getting it, they're, they have the right answers, then I'm going to try to talk them out of it. Do you really believe that? Well, now, wait a minute. What if you murder somebody, can you still go to heaven? And I've had people, well, no. And I'm thinking, well, you weren't listening to a thing I said. You know, David murdered. Well, so in a lot of, well, yeah, I think so. Well, did Jesus die for just the little sins or the big sins also? Oh, well, the big sins. Well, what about suicide? Well, isn't that one of the unforgivable sins? Now listen, people, suicide is a trick question. I'm gonna be honest, it is a trick question. There are people that are saved, that are not in church, that are not founded in their doctrine, that if you say, what if you commit suicide, will you go to heaven? They'll say, man, I, I'm not really sure. I think so. All right, if they're saved, they'll hear the voice of the shepherd. You can teach them. You know, hey, I mean, suicide is murder. You're murdering your own body. You know, you can't take yourself out of God's hand. So is murder a sin that God died for? Of course. Is, is murder a sin that can be forgiven? Yes. What about suicide? Well, I always use the illustration, there's two men in the Bible that committed suicide. You think of, of Samson, the mighty man, at the end of his life, he pulled the building down on himself and he killed the enemy and himself as well. And another example would be uh, King Saul. Hey, he, he was saved, he prophesied for God, he had certain things right, and then later in his life, he started messing up, he got his life wrong, he's surrounded by the enemy, he puts his sword in the ground and he falls on it, killing himself, but the Bible tells us that he is in heaven also. So, suicide will not send you to hell. And, you know, those are questions that are very important that you can ask people to gauge whether they're getting it or not. If they just outright say, no, you can't commit suicide, then they're not listening. If they, if they kind of, I don't know, I guess so. I mean, it, you know, well, is it everlasting? Is the gift conditional on your works, on your lifestyle, or is it a free gift? So that's how you can use things at certain points, especially as you're wrapping up, to make sure that you're troubleshooting them properly. You know, it's sort of like problem solving skills, right? There's many of you in here that, that aren't computer nerds, but maybe you're a mechanic and you troubleshoot your car. Well, what about this? Do I have fire? Do I have gas? Do I, you know, there's certain things, steps you would go through. You know, or whatever your job is, there's certain things that you're, you have wisdom enough to be able to foresee where a problem is. Even, even a wife, a, a stay-at-home mom, you're cooking a cake and something's not going right. There's a series of steps that you would go through 
to be able to figure out what's wrong with the cake. Uh-oh, the stove's not hot enough. Uh-oh, I didn't put enough salt in there. Whatever it is, don't ask me on cooking. But you get the point is that we are troubleshooting hearts. We are troubleshooting souls. And the only way to gauge where they're at is to ask questions. To ask them and find out what they believe and, and uh, where they're at. So it does use, it requires problem solving skills. We want to find out what's broken in their heart, in their belief system, and we want to fix it with a verse. A very important concept is to love who you're with. I was soul winning with a, with a couple from out of town recently and they said that the, the guy they go soul winning with has a tendency to, and they're silent, has a tendency to run off and leave them at the door. We were, I'm presenting, I'm, I'm preaching to, a, to someone, they're with me, uh, some, a couple comes up to be a distraction and they had the wisdom to get them away from the situation so we could continue preaching to the person at the door. They did the right thing. After the fact, I brought it up and they said, yeah, who we normally go with, he'll leave us at the door, he'll say, stay right here, and he'll go chase somebody down. But his presentation is under 10 minutes, so there's a problem with that guy. There's a problem with his presentation. There's a problem with his mentality in that, hey, you believe this first, you believe that? Okay, pray with me real quick, and i got to go back over here and get these guys to pray. No, it's not about that. It's about true understanding. So you have to love the people that you're with as if they're the only ones that you get to talk to today. When somebody opens the door and they let you start open your Bible and start presenting, you need to have the mentality that as long as their heart's in the right direction, you'll stay for two hours if it takes two hours. That that soul is so valuable, you're not going to hurry up and just run off well, look, I've been here 20 minutes. If you don't get it yet, you know. No, be patient with people. Be long-suffering. Jesus was very long-suffering with us. And look, he knows our name. You should know their name. That's right. You should ask their name. And when you ask their name, I recommend you repeat their name. Amen. You can repeat it three times and shake their hand, and you'll like put it in your brain. Okay, that helps. But repeat their name throughout the presentation. So when you start to ask a question... And let me ask you this, Marcel. If you committed suicide, would you still go to heaven? Now, when I said Marcel's name, I got his attention, right? I think he was on Facebook. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you think about it. You, people like to hear their name. Amen. They do. It's a fact. And if you say their name throughout the presentation, you will captivate them. You will keep their attention. And it shows that you actually care. Why should they listen to you if you're not listening to them? What was your name again? Bob? Oh, Sally. Sorry. <laughs> you get one of those, walk away. <laughs> That's why I always use Revelation 2018. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable. You know what abomination is? Homosexuals, perverts, child molesters. Okay, just checking. <laughs> hey, if you think, if you start presenting to somebody and they seem like they are a pervert, like if you think they're a homo, just ask them. If they are a homo, they will not be offended. Yeah, okay. And then... You just, let me see that invitation. Yeah, let me, okay. I don't think our church would really be for you, okay? You don't have to teach them Romans 1. Now, if they ask you, you can show them Romans 1. If they ask you. But, you know, again, be looking for an out because that person may sit there and waste 30 minutes of your time and just ask them straight up. We, we actually had a, a situation where a protester tried to come in our church and she was dressed like an ugly dude. I mean, she was well, the ugliest dude I've ever seen. And she had two real effeminate sissy guys with her. And we met them at the door. And I stuck out my hand to, to shake her hand. I took control of the situation so they couldn't come in. And I asked them, are you a lesbian? Well, I, uh, 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 okay, well, you're not welcome here. Well, later that night, a young man visited our church. And let's just say he was a little too well-dressed. Now, he's one of us, man. He is saved. He knows his doctrine. We never met the guy before. We've been getting weird phone calls all week. We had these people show up. And then uh, Brother Ross was like, just goes right up to it. Are you a fag? And you're like, <laughs> guys like, no, I, um, I, I, I love Pastor Ant-Man. Once saved, always saved. You know, reprobates are on time. I mean, he was like trying to like spit out his... Now, he wasn't offended either, right? So sometimes it's okay to ask these questions. And yeah, you might offend somebody. But hey, the gospel itself is offensive. We're not going out there trying to be offensive, but your time is valuable. The gospel is a precious gift. So don't 
neglect your time and let somebody abuse your time. If you don't respect your own time, neither will they. So it's very important to, to see who you're dealing with. In fact, you can use what I call a takeaway. If, if you're talking to somebody and they just kind of, I saw Brother Theo do this last week. He's talking to a young man. He's got headphones in and he keeps, and he, oh, uh, you got headphones in. Yeah, I just kind of do that. And he goes, oh, okay. Do they uh, enhance your hearing? What? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know, that was the kindest way of saying, take the headphones out, buddy. I'm trying to get your attention, right? He was, but then the guy kept texting and Brother Theo started to take away from him. And basically, well, I mean, do you, are you paying attention? I know you got a conversation going there, but do you want to hear what I have to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll listen to what you have to say, All right? A takeaway is also very important. It goes hand in hand in loving who you're with because you never know who's next and you love their time. You haven't met them yet. But when you're with somebody that is listening, pour your heart into it. Yeah. Don't just, don't just kind of do it halfway. Don't neglect to get their name. Amen. It's your job to compel them to listen and to compel them to go to church. And it's easier when you get to the end. Imagine, and this has happened, it's happened to me. They've heard, they believed, you're done preaching, they pray, you know for sure, they're excited, you can tell they're saved, and then you, you, you go to invite them to the church. Now look, you should come to our church. What was your name again? Oh, I didn't get your name. Uh, not cool, right? You, you just shared a moment in their spiritual birth with them and you forgot to get their name. Again, I, I strongly recommend adding that into your introduction somewhere and checking yourself. You know, maybe when, when you get to, to Romans 6.23, make it a goal to use their name. That way, if you haven't asked for their name yet, it reminds you to get their name. So add that into your presentation somewhere. But also, again, are, are you listening? You know, be ready to take it away from them and go to those that want to hear it. Now, you're in Proverbs 26. I want you to look at verse number 4. It says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer not a fool, because you don't want to be like him. There are some people and some questions and some conversations that you must avoid. And, you know, well, what about aliens? <laughs> Let's get back to that. Let me focus on what I have here. Let me get through this, and then I'll, I'll answer all of your questions you've ever had about the Bible. But first, we need to talk about this. Listen, with some people, you need to be long-suffering and patient enough to overlook their ignorance, to overlook dumb questions out of love for them, and you know, unless it becomes a problem. You know, if they ask about aliens, and they interrupt you for that and you and you move past it and then 10 minutes later they're talking about Nephilim and then 10 minutes later they're talking about the flat earth they're not respecting your time they want to talk about every conspiracy on you know on YouTube man you, you know they're not really going to hear what you're what you're saying so answer not a fool according to the well, well you know sometimes you know you need to, to deal with those situations but listen salvation doctrine comes first these things are spiritually discerned you cannot give a biblical answer about aliens until they're saved. If you give them the right answer, they're not going to receive it if they're not saved. Listen, not all Christians believe right on aliens either, but there's, there's more hope that they'll see the truth if they've believed on the Lord first. There, there's a process. You need to follow it up. Listen, that's why the YouTube card, uh, you know, I created it as something to leave with people, but it's actually a great conversation starter. Hey, do you guys watch YouTube? Oh, perfect. Here, you got to get... Or, hey, did you guys get one of these yet? Great conversation starter. But it's also a way to dust the feet. Okay, well, you're not... Li a flat earth? Okay. Aliens? Okay, hey, tell you what. We've got some great documentaries here you can watch, right? You need to watch this video up here. Here you go. Have a nice day. You're done. It's an exit strategy. It's something... It's a tool you can use to change the subject, to end the conversation, and to walk. Because... Some people will ask foolish questions, and if you answer them according to their folly, you become the fool. You yourself are acting like a fool. You're answering the fool, and they're, you're, they're keeping you from preaching to people that will listen. Now, but that, look at the next verse. Look at the, the, the contrast here. Verse number five, it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, 
lest he be wise in his own conceit. There is a time to answer a fool, and it's to show them that they're a fool. It's to show them that they're not wise. Again, salvation doctrine comes first. And you fix the rest later unless it's directly impeding the presentation. A recent guy we're, we're, we're preaching to, he, he brought up baptism. We don't have to answer baptism saves. We're going to answer it by teaching faith alone. But then he brings it up again and he says, well, I was raised church of God. And right away a red flag went up in my head. And he says, and I've heard my whole life there's certain things you have to do. And yet, the church I go to now, and pretty much the way I feel is, it's just kind of by faith. So I'm having a hard time balancing, juggling these things. So I answered what the church of God preaches. I got that out of the way so he can move on with the gospel. In his mind, church of God teaches you have to repent and be baptized to be saved. They teach that you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. And they will actually defend it and say, well, that's not actually works. It's just the process of getting saved. Hey, baptism is a work. Right. Repenting is a work. Amen. It totally is. And, and so recognizing what this guy had said, knowing what verses he was raised hearing, I stopped the presentation. Well, let me show you this. Turn, go ahead and turn to Mark 16. Let's deal with this. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. Let's deal with this. Let me show you in context how what you've heard your whole life is wrong. And then he kind of said, oh, okay. Now, Back to the presentation. Back to salvation by faith alone, without works. It's an everlasting gift that will never go away. Then he could connect the dots. So it is important sometimes to answer a question to highlight that where they're at is wrong. And listen, I'm not calling that guy a fool. He got saved. He was wise. But he, I answered him so he was not wise in his own conceit, thinking the religion I was raised with is how I'm going to get saved. It's very important to be able to discern the difference. We also need to pre be prepared to rebuke. You have the authority. God has given you the authority. And when somebody's wrong on certain things, yes, there's a second and a third admonition. And if they continue with the problem, you need to rebuke them and walk away. You need to let them know. Sometimes there are people that are hard of understanding. And they're not getting what you're saying. And you know you may give them a second verse or a third verse. I think it's better, first of all, to give a better illustration about the verse you're on. Before you put more words in their mind, define the words that you've just given them. If they're having a hard time understanding John 3.16, break it down, explain every word, give them an illustration about perish being death, about everlasting... I always ask, how long does everlasting life last for? And now here's an example of an illustration I will use occasionally when I need, but I do not use it in every presentation. I'll point at their porch light. And I'll say, if I give you an everlasting light bulb, how long would it last for? Well, forever. So if it ever burned out for any reason, was it really an everlasting light bulb? No. Okay. Eternal life is the same way. You, you take it to a simple illustration of something tangible and then you bring it back to spiritual things to help them discern and know what you're teaching. So it's better to, to give them a better illustration. You can also give them additional verses. That's where it's good for every point. If you want to know what to study, you know, look at your presentation and say, okay, what if they don't believe in hell after I've shown them you know, you know, the punishment of death, and then I show them revelation that it's death and hell. What if they still don't believe in hell? What other verses can I use to teach hell? And if you give them three verses and they still say, oh, I don't believe there's a hell, well, they're, they're not going to receive the presentation. It may be a time to rebuke them and leave. And you can rebuke them in love. You can tell them straight up, well, you can close your Bible. Here's this YouTube card. You can watch this if you want. But I'm going to tell you the Bible teaches that the only way to get to heaven is to believe that Jesus was God, He died for all of your sins, and trusting in Him is the only way to get to heaven. And if you reject the gospel, you will end up in hell. Have a great day. <laughs> it's necessary because then you've summarized the gospel, you've warned them, you're leaving them some information, and I get calls all the time. I got a call about Brother Joe, some little old lady. Well now, he can't just tell people they're going to hell. Well, ma'am, I know Brother Joe, and he's not a rude guy. Let me ask you this. 
What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Well, you can't tell people I do it my way and you can do it your way. Ma'am, according to the Bible, there is a judgment. And if you're trying to work your way to heaven, you will end up in hell. About that time she was done and she hung up. You know, it's okay. I can do that without being rude, but we need to be prepared to rebuke, especially when they're being contentious. Especially when they're just, well, you, you stupid Christians, or you can't, you know, the lady the other day, well, I believe once saved, always saved is a lie. Time to rebuke. Right. Time to rebuke. You can't change what I believe. Okay, time to rebuke and walk on down the road. Yeah. Be prepared. You're there in authority. Look, you're not picking a fight. Don't get the cops called on you. But at the same time, stand your ground. The Bible is right. The gospel is right. It's a free gift, and they have to know that. One other important thing I want to bring up is, is learning from your loss. This is how you grow as a soul winner. If you've ever come across somebody that was a Calvinist and you didn't really have an answer, well, they just said that Jesus didn't die for everybody. I didn't know what verses to take them to. Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4, you know, 2 Peter 3, those are verses. Those are things you can only know once you've studied them. And when you cross paths with somebody that says something that you don't know how to answer, you mark that down. You study that out in your own time. If you're serious about being a good soul winner, and you're serious about being able to troubleshoot people and helping them to be persuaded that Jesus is God and He's the Savior, then you need to sharpen your sword. Yeah. You need to add things to your arsenal. It's like putting an extra bullet, getting one more bullet. Oh, I got one for a Calvinist now. Now I'm ready. Right? And then sure enough, you'll probably need it as soon as you have it. Oh, I'm, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. You're a Pentecostal. We need to deal with that. There are certain things you're going to learn to listen for, you're going to hear. And when somebody says something like that, because I was talking about this from last week, and I've had several people that said, yeah, I've heard that same thing. Well, why didn't you study it out? Why didn't you search it out and find out what they mean by that? Now, obviously, if they start boasting of the Holy Spirit, you know, they probably don't have the Holy Spirit. It's, it's that false gift, the Pentecostalism. But are you ready for a Pentecostal? Are you ready to show a Pentecostal somebody that wants to be saved, that knows they're not saved, and are you willing to show them what their doctrinal error? If they will, if they are listening, you know, like answering a fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own conceit. Well, ma'am, the Bible teaches something about tongues. If I show you, will you receive it? Well, if it says it, I'll believe it. Well, then you got something there. I had a, a Jehovah's Witness one time that just started, I mean, Weird situation, music blaring like this, like devil music. I mean, literally devil music blaring. All sorts of stickers on his car, tattoos were going on. Jehovah's Witness, Jesus isn't God. I said, if I can show you 10 verses out of the Bible right now that Jesus is God, will you believe it? No. I didn't say another word. I walked. Why? What, am I, what can I say? He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to believe it. It's a waste of my time even to say goodbye. Right? I just turned and walked. I had nothing else to say. You need to double check people. This is the most important. This is where I think most uh, starter soul winners don't just get comfortable in having your set of verses, your presentation. That's the core. That's the framework. Do not leave the framework. Do not bloat the framework. But there's certain points in your presentation where you need to be ready to double check them. Like I said, to talk them out of their salvation. When I get to the point with somebody, where I'm fairly confident that they're, they get it, they're believing it, they're saying, oh yeah, just by faith, oh just believe, that's all you got to do. No, of course you can never lose it. It said everlasting. When they start saying things like that, then I try to talk them out of it. What if you commit suicide? Well, what if you stop believing? Does anybody have an answer for that? Somebody have an answer? Titus 1. Titus 1, because he made a promise, that's right. Say it again. Say it louder. If you believe not, he abideth faithful. Yet if we be believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Hey, he made a promise. And if I give you this Bible as a free gift and you stick it under your bed and ten years from now, you say, I don't know if I even really got that Bible. Does it change the fact that you have it, that you received it as a free gift and it's always yours? Of course not. So there are certain things you can ask. And that is a trick question. You know, uh, what is that? Second, Second Timothy three sixteen, I believe. Two thirteen. <coughs> thank you. 
Yeah, 2 Timothy 2.13 is a good one. Sometimes I'll take them to Psalm 89 where it talks about if they break my covenant and forsake my laws, that he will correct them. Yet his covenant he will not break. God made a promise. Hey, you can, you can go live like hell. I mean, guess what? You're going to get corrected on the earth. And in troubleshooting somebody, and when you get to the point where you're talking them out of it just to see if they really have it or not, because if they have it, you're not going to be able to talk them out of it. Period. Whether it's the beginning of the conversation or the end. But as you're doing this, you know, the, the goal is to, to use these illustrations to try to take it away from them to just firm them up so that they know they've got the right answer. The idea is not to trick them. Ha ha, I got you. You're not saved again. Wait a minute, what? You know what I mean? If, they feel, if they're uncertain, then educate them. But, you know, the extreme of that is you're tricking them. And the other extreme is you're giving them all the answers so they don't believe they're just answering to pass the test. They don't have it committed to their heart. One of, the, one of the most important things, you know, in Matthew 28, Jesus tells us that it's not just preaching. He says, go ye, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way, even to the end of the world. Amen. Jesus is commanding us to make disciples. And listen, if you love them like you ought while you're at the door, when you get done and they actually get saved, and, and their life is changed, then it's time for you to compel them to go to church, to compel them to obey the Scriptures. I will typically use uh, Revelation 1, verse 3. If you want to turn there real quick, I'll show you how I use that. Revelation 1. Discipleship from somebody that gets saved at the door is, is sort of rare. And in our movement, there's a lot of people that have a short soul winning presentation. They're not studying to defend against stronger people. And even worse, there are some people that never that think discipleship is like a bad word. All right? You know, the old IFB has some things right. And that is visitation. To complement soul winning, though. Visitation is not a replacement to right. soul winning. Right. If they say, well, soul winning doesn't bring them in, we're just going to do visitation, they're wrong. Now, when you get somebody saved, here in our church, we have a series of tools that are freely available. We have a John in Romans. This is a great thing to carry with you and leave with the person at the door. This is something they can read. We also have a free gift New Testament. You, you know, some people will give these out to the people that get saved. Some people hold on to them and wait and make sure it's somebody that's actually going to read it. Listen, if you just come up to somebody and you say, here, take all the, I want you to take all this stuff, well, they don't appreciate it, okay? We have free gift Bibles we give out, but we don't give these out soul winning typically because we have a new believer packet. We have a system for discipleship. It starts by when you have somebody that actually seems interested. Somebody that says, I haven't gone to church in a while and I'm looking for a church. If they start out by talking about that, that's a tie down. Refer back to that if they get saved and say, look, I want you to go to church. The Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need fellowship. We need to talk to each other. We need to be encouraged by each other. It you know, it's not just preaching. Church is more than preaching. We have the New Believer card. You get their name, their information. And on the back is follow-up. On the back, this is for the soul winner. This is for the person that got them saved. And we've had some people that say, here, I got them saved. Go get them, Brother Fannin. Well, I'm working a 60, 70 hour a week job. When am I going to do that? You know? And I encourage people that if you're a Saturday soul winner, when your soul winning time is up on Saturday, then take another half hour and go follow up with somebody from last week. Go follow up with somebody from last month. Go check in on them. Hey, you remember me? Just check how you doing. Did you, you, know, I, I, did you get that packet? So what we do is you get their information. You mail them a packet. The postage is on it. We have return labels. You write their name on it. You send it to them. Inside the packet is information about the church, a welcome letter. There's information about what they've believed. There's information about how to go to heaven in case they miss something. There's information about how we're commanded to be baptized, as Acts chapter 10 tells us. So we have enough information here. Oh, and there's a sermon. We have a sermon on a disc. So if they never show up, we have the first step of teaching them all things. Now, if they receive this in the mail, and they open it up, and they see a coupon for a free Bible, and then they come to church and they say, well, he gave me this Bible, but I'm going to go to church to get this Bible. 
right? So I don't encourage people to take all of the nice Bibles and just give them away to everybody they talk to because people don't value it. Yeah. If they show up to come get this Bible, let them have it. Let them take two if they need to. You know, then, you know, very liberal. But the idea is you want to create some incentive for them to come. So then as a soul winner, you have it on the back of the card, what date you spoke to them that they got saved. Phone calls, you put the date. Well, I called them, I didn't get an answer. You call them the next day. Hey, you can make a note there. I say, hey, I was just following up with you. Did you receive the packet? So if you're a Saturday soul winner, it gets dropped in Saturday. Or if you're a Sunday soul winner, it gets dropped in on Monday. By Thursday, you should be calling them. It doesn't take that. You can call them by Wednesday. But hey, did you receive the packet? You know, call them on Friday. Hey, it's the weekend. Church is coming up. It's on Sunday. And we're having a special day. I want you to be my guest. Will you come be my guest? Oh, you didn't receive the packet? Well, hold on. Is your address? Oh, I wrote it wrong. I'm going to mail you another one. But in the meantime, why don't you come to church and I've got a free Bible for you? Right? Use these things as incentive. You can verbally tell them at the door, if, and if you come to, to church, we'll give you a free Bible. I used to give out a ton of Bibles while I was soul winning, and I, I believe it's better, I think it's a better method to entice them with a free gift. Hey, we give away hundreds of these. These are great. It's the New Testament. It's easy to read. It's got all of our information. It's marked with the plan of salvation in case they miss something. So, so this is a great tool. It's, it's absolutely better than nothing. Uh, the John and Romans, again, this itself is fantastic for a new believer. They've got the meat. They need John and Romans. It's a great start. If they read through this and they're hungry for more, come on. We got a Bible for you, you know. So with that, you have, you have handwritten notes, personal visits. This little box has a tendency to get omitted. You call them to verify, and if you're a Sunday soul winner, and you say, okay, we're, you know, church is at 5.30, I'm going to stop soul winning at 4, and I'm going to take half an hour, and I'm going to go see so-and-so from last week. I'm going to mark down my personal visit. This is your most powerful tool for discipleship. You know, Jesus told His disciples to go and do likewise. Right? Go get your own disciples, and many of them did. They went, and they multiplied themselves, and that is your goal. You know, you as a Christian should be creating more Christians and more disciples. Because it would encourage, you know, you would be encouraged to find, yeah, this guy, he started coming and he got on fire and he started listening to sermons and now he's a soul winner. And whenever he gets somebody saved, you can kind of say, cool, praise the Lord. You know, pat yourself on the back a little. <laughs> no, look, don't brag on yourself, but hey, you know, God has a plan and it's from faith to faith. There's a, there are fake people out there that have a fake soul winning presentation. They're not saved. They think it's by works. And the people that get saved or pray with them, it's the same faith. The faith in what? Their own works. That false spirit. And I've been with people that we found out later they were lying. They were totally unsaved. They were calling people after the fact saying, now you know you got to do the works. But Brother Fanny, you saw them pray. They, I mean, the, the person prayed with them. Yeah, but they didn't get saved. If that guy wasn't saved, the person that prayed didn't get saved. They went along, they would go along to get along. They just went along with what they said to get them off the doorstep. So listen, having a, a true love for the people. Jesus had compassion on people. And as a soul winner, you need to have compassion enough to try to compel them to become a disciple. Use the New Believer follow-up cards. We've got packets, John and Romans, Bibles. We've got everything you need. We provide all the tools and resources and yet, it still requires another step from you. And that's to mail the packet, to pick up the phone, and then go see them. If you do these things, this system works. If you follow up with people and actually go see them, they will go to church. I promise you, it's worked for me. But Pastor Romero and I were just talking about another pastor in another state. And he's not really of our movement per se, but he's a soul winner. He's zealous. He's been doing it for years. And he has had his church split or cut in half three different times. And the only way he builds the church is by soul winning and follow-up. And follow-up. Now listen, I know there are people that come to our church because they see the soul winning and God has blessed us and increased our church by those that say, I want to be a soul winner. I'm moving. And I believe that's the Lord rewarding and building the church because we, we're keeping the main thing the main thing. We're keeping the priorities right. But our responsibility to this local community has not ceased. Right. 
We have a family that's starting to become consistent and they're, they're, they found us through soul winning. And they may not know everything about the rapture yet, but they're hearing, they're learning, they're getting on fire. And their girls are getting excited. Yeah, Pastor, I heard what you said about wearing pants. Yeah, Pastor, I heard what you said about sleeping around and I'm, not, I'm gonna keep myself pure. Hey, thank God. They're going to grow when they hear the preaching if their heart is right. And mama loves it. Yeah, I love it. That's old fat. That's cool. That's the way it should be. You know, and I'm, I'm well, am I going to offend him? Oh, well, I'm just going to say what God wants me to say and let him sort it out. But listen, as soul winners, I cannot stress this enough. Ask questions. Troubleshoot the people. Be friendly. Be loving. Truly have a heart of love and compassion for them. If you do, you can connect with, hey, I'm back. How you doing? I just came by to see you again. Are you going to make it to church? Do you need a ride? Hey, if you want, I can come and I'll pull up in front of your house and you can follow me. I'll lead you to church so you don't get lost. You know, call them on Sunday morning if you think that's appropriate. You have to find your own balance in that. But we are commanded to create disciples also. And I, I believe that, you know, it's a greater success to get one person saved this week that next week wants to be a soul winner then it would be to say only get two this week because if that one becomes a soul winner and you've multiplied yourself and the next week both of you go soul winning and both of you get one person that's already three yeah. and you can do the math you know the exponential curve i mean god wants more and more people to get on fire for him and i truly believe there are people on probably on your own block on your street that want to be zealous for god they're probably zealous in the wrong direction without true knowledge and if you could connect with them and show them the truth they would be just as on fire as you are but it starts from a sincere heart of love that's our responsibility one thing that i'll do once i'm done is i will ask people well are there any questions you've ever had about the bible i had a, a young lady last week that said yeah can a racist go to heaven whoa <laughs> Now, she was, she was mixed between two different races. Mom and dad were different. And obviously, there was something on her heart. Somebody had said something to this girl that hurt her heart, and maybe they were a Christian. Maybe because, you know, of Trump or whatever, people have this, you know, oh, Trump's, you know, you know, I mean, there's so much divide and conquer from our government coming down on us. So I just asked her questions to help her answer the question. Well, what does the Bible say you have to do to go to heaven? Well, just believe. Okay, now if I'm a murderer, but I believe, can I go to heaven? Well, of course. So if I'm a racist and I believe, can I go to heaven? She says, yeah. So once she, once she got it, then I said, listen, the Bible says he's made all nations of one blood. God is not a respecter of persons. I believe racism is a wicked sin. God does not bless that. We should not support that. But if somebody really is saved and they happen to be racist, they'll still get to heaven. But I believe God will correct them on the earth. Yeah. Right, and that's always a good time you know, as you're, as you're finishing your soul winning, you say, and by the way, oh, you're in, you're in Revelation chapter 1. We didn't read this. Look at verse number 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth. There is a blessing for reading the Bible. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. Prophecy means preaching. God has promised you a blessing if you'll go to church and hear the preaching. It says, And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. There's a blessing if you obey God's commandment. If you disobey God's law, He will correct you on the earth because He'll never cast you into hell. Jesus died and went to hell so you don't have to go. He eliminated your punishment. So because of that, He will correct your flesh on the earth when you disobey His laws. Now if you obey His laws and you keep His commandments, He will bless you. And so I usually preface this verse by saying, do you want God's blessing on your life? And I smile and I be quiet until they say, well, yeah, duh, everybody does. Okay, good. And then I read it to them. So that's a, that's a good verse to use at the end. I, I do believe it's important to tell them that, you know, if you were baptized before, you need to get re-baptized. Before, you just got wet. And, and I've had people that kind of, well, wait a minute, but I've already been baptized. Well, did you have the everlasting gift? Remember, you thought you could lose it. Okay, I, I didn't. So then baptism is the symbol that you were once spiritually dead and now you're alive forevermore. So in that regard, yes, I do believe it's important to teach that. However, if time does not permit, it's okay. So it is sort of a personal preference. 
I like to provoke them to good works. I like to provoke them to get in church. You need to come get baptized. Let me get your address. I'm going to send you some information on that. And I'm going to send you a coupon for a free Bible. So that's a good way to handle that as you transition. So Romans 10 is typically where you go once you've completed your presentation to take them there, to, to provoke them to call on the Lord. Now, again, I talked about tie-downs. You have to get it out of their mouth to begin with that they're trusting in their works. If you are successful at that, when you come into this problem, you know word for word what they've said and you tell them what they've said. Right? So, well, I know you said you've already prayed, but remember when I first started and you told me that you thought you had to be a good person and be baptized to go to heaven? The Bible teaches something different, doesn't it? Now, I usually say that anyway because I've already, I was foreshadowing, planning on coming to this point. So I will, before I read Romans 10, I actually say that. So if you get to Romans 10 and you have that problem, you can say it there. But you're, you're, you know what they said that was wrong, you remind them what they said. I had this one time with my wife, we were soul winning in some apartments, and she was preaching to this guy, and I mean, he had a Jesus shirt on, right? And she's giving him the gospel, and he get, she gets to the end, and he's just like, yeah, but, but I already did that. And she looked at me, and I said, sir, and then I stepped in, she did a great presentation. I said, sir, when we started, you said, boom, boom, boom. And he, he, he shakes his head. No, you're right. You're right. Because it takes somebody humbling themselves to say they were wrong. And she told him he was wrong at the beginning. She told him the presentation. He changed what he believed, but he, he just still didn't want to humble himself enough to say he was wrong. And that's very important. If somebody will not pray with you, you either failed to make something clear or they really don't believe it. I don't care if they give you all the right answers. There's somebody recently that... It was said of her that she, she had told Pastor, I didn't call in my heart or with my mouth. Well, she's not saved. Right. If they're not call, I mean, you're not saved. Calling on the name of the Lord started in Genesis chapter 4, right? Then men, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Why? What did they do? They're saying, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. And Pastor Romero gave the example one time about the calling. You know, calling an election because a lot of the Calvinists will misuse it. And he took out a $20 bill. He said, I got a free gift for anybody that wants it. And everybody kind of giggled and looked. Alberto Hernandez said, hey man, I'll take that thing. He said, there you go. I've called, you've responded, right? How do you set him to your seal? How do you call the Lord? You say, hey, I'll take that gift. Yeah, I want that. You know, in the same way, in an election, election time, they put the call out. They put signs everywhere. They put advertisements on the radio and on TV. They're calling, come pick me. And how do you go vote? You go in the voting booth and you say, I'll call that guy. I'm, I'm electing him. I'm selecting him. I'm, I'll set him as my God and Savior. You see what I'm saying? So those terminologies are a little bit twisted with people today. But if you don't pray with somebody to provoke them to call on the Lord, then you know you can't, well, okay, all done here. I hope the best for you. I hope you figure it out. No. They're probably, oh, what do I do? Most people, when you bring them to pray, they will say, I'm not really sure how. That's okay. I'm going to help you. Let me help you tell God you've changed your mind. That's very important. I've seen somebody that will say, I just get to that point and I just say, okay, we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Bow your head. Bow your head. Wrong. Do not do that. Yeah. People need to understand. I had somebody one time, several years ago, where I'm praying with them and I say, I, be I, I believe I deserve hell. And they stopped and said, I don't believe that. I failed. Right? If I just bullied my way through it, I would have continued to fail. I would have made them it harder for them to actually get saved. So I stopped and corrected the error. So I, you know, you can start your soul winning presentation in Romans 3.23. I usually start it with 3.10 because I like to foreshadow. There are none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says nobody's righteous. Righteous means to be perfect or to always do the right thing. And I'll ask them, are you perfect? No. You think I'm perfect? No. Do you know any, you know any people that think they are perfect? You know, I get a laugh out of them. I try to lighten it. But, but I start and then I go back and I teach what righteousness is. Righteous. To always do the right thing. To be perfect. And then when I'm done, I go to Romans chapter 10 and look at verse number 10. Look at the first half of the verse. It says, For with the heart 
man believeth unto righteousness. Now stop right there. The Bible is teaching that even though, remember I started in where he said they're none righteous, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. Well, here it says, in the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. If you put your trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone, the Bible says it's like you are righteous. And then I'll ask them, does, does that mean you'll stop sinning? <laughs> no. But what it's saying here is that your soul is preserved unto the day of redemption. That God looks down and He sees you like you are a perfect person because the perfection of Christ was put on you. And of course, I've built up to that. I, I use... Uh, uh, John 5 24 we're passed from death unto life I usually use that but I start at the first half of 10 and then I move back to verse number 9 so instead of starting at 9 or reading all of 10 I read that just that first half to connect the dots of righteousness the beginning to the end I go full circle and then at verse 9 if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and I do it just like that I point with my mouth and I point to the if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart the man be believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Typically, I don't read verse 11. But if in a problem like you're talking about, if they say, well, I don't believe it, I'll go to verse number 11. I say, well, the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Are you ashamed to say that Jesus died for your sins? Well, no. Are you ashamed to say that he's the only way to heaven and everybody else will go? To well, no. Are you ashamed to say what you believed before was wrong? Well, no. Okay. Now we can go to verse 13. Even if you've already read verse 13, you know you can use verse 11 as a crux to remind them that tie down that, hey, you said you were trusting in baptism, and now you need to change that. You need to tell God you've changed your mind. Flor Florida law on solicitation is clear that it's something that you're selling, and they have ruled that you have a religious freedom to preach the gospel. Now, a gated community is private property, okay? It, so they own the street. And, you know, if you stood in your neighbor's street and, was, you know, and it was yelling at your neighbor, I mean, you're in the street, you're public property, right? You know, it shouldn't come to the point of calling the cops. In gated communities, you know, I'll usually wait and then just make it through or get somebody to go stand at the gate and get it to open so everybody else can come in, you know? But once you're in, if you find somebody like that, just walk away. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I'll go. Well, you can't solicit. You can't. I'm not soliciting. I'm, I'm giving away a free gift. Well, I'm going to call the cops. Okay, call the cops. And you just keep walking. And if, if it may be best to leave the building that you're in, and if the cops show up, well, who all is with you? I'm ready to go. I'll leave. Well, how many people are in here with your church? You know, I don't really know. But I'm here and I'll leave. I don't want to cause any problems. Well, you need to tell us. No, I don't. <laughs> you, know, you don't have the right. Yes, I do. <laughs> We're going to arrest you for what? <laughs> You know, I mean, don't get in a fight with them, but Florida law is very clear about that, that you, you do have a right for religious speech to knock on somebody's door. That door is publicly accessible. The street is public property. I can park in front of your house and I can walk up and knock on your door. Until you tell me to go away, then it becomes trespassing. Get out of there before it gets to that situation. But the same thing with the park buildings too. Is that private property? It is. It is. Now, some apartments have public streets. You can park on the street. They could threaten to come tow your car and all that. I mean, if, that's, if it gets real ugly, then yeah, call everybody and get out of there. But for the most part, if, they, if the apartment management comes to kick you out, then take one for the team and just go and let everybody else do what they're going to do. Because if you're at an apartment, I guarantee there's probably another apartment across the street. Right? There's apartments nearby. There's houses nearby. You could probably walk to them. You know? So in that regard, don't be confrontational. Yes, sir. Would it be prudent to have that law, the Florida law, printed out on like on a three by five card? You could. I mean, I don't, I don't know that citing the statute's going to change their mind. Yeah, but if they're angry enough, they don't care. Because even the cops, you know, they they may say, well, we're going to arrest you for resisting arrest, or we're going to arrest you for trespassing, and we'll let the judge figure out whether you broke the law or not. You know what I mean? So it, it, it never should get to that point. I will always tell them that I am not soliciting whenever that's said. But at the same time, it's just as if somebody said, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't have time. Okay. Right. I'm not going to waste my time with you. I'm going to go. I'm not going to stand and argue Florida statutes with you. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it might be helpful. You could show it to them. But do you think it would change their heart? Do you think they would say, oh, well, you do have the right to knock on my door. Okay, tell me how to go to heaven. You know, <laughs> if that worked, I would do it.
<laughs> I was thinking it, it would prevent them from calling the cops and having to knock on the next one. The majority of the people are going to call the church first. I get a lot of calls. Pastor Romero got a call about about me one time. Uh, remember Brother Jared and I were out soul winning and it was two dykes? Yeah. And, and they were like, man, they had the right answer. Well, it's just by faith alone. It's in Jesus only. Hmm. Okay. Either the Bible's wrong or you're lying. Let's find out. So we proceeded and next thing you know, they're saying, well, you can't trust that King James. you got to get a Hebrew-inspired Bible and you got to have the power of the Holy. you got to be a tongue-talking devil like me. You know. She went to Kevin, uh, Kenneth Copeland's church. So, and, and Jared defended the King James. He showed her where you're wrong. And she, you know, said a couple things about the Jews and we went on down the road. She calls Pastor Romero and he, later he played the voicemail for me. She said, your people are going around saying if you're not Baptist, you're going to hell. That's not what we said. But she lied. But we expect that. She's a liar. She's a dyke. You know what I mean? She's a, she's a weirdo. She's a pervert. But, yeah, more than likely they'll call the church first. And... If, when Pastor Romero gets a call about somebody preaching the gospel, he backs them up. I do the same thing. Now, again, if, if you're a problem person and I get a call about you every week, we're going to talk. We've had guys like this. We, well, they said that they, it, was, it wasn't faith alone. I had to fight them. I'm like, calm down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Patient. <laughs> yeah. Gospel of peace. Hello. <laughs>
you know exactly what they believe, what they were trusting in, and it may be that you have to include something about not trusting in baptism instead of just saying you can't trust in works. If they said they're trusting in baptism, you better include the word baptism when you define works. That way they can connect those dots. So, no, it's just by faith alone. Okay. Uh, in God? What, who, who, what name is God? Oh, it's, well, it's Jesus. You know, okay, well, cool, we're on the same page. If they say, and they may even say, well, just believe in Jesus. You think you can never lose it? Nope. What if you murdered somebody? Nope. What if, you know, you believe today, but, you know, 10 years from now, God forbid, you did something terrible, like, you know, you robbed a liquor store and you got in a shot out, shootout with the cops and you didn't have a chance to say, I'm sorry for your sin before you died. A lot of people will give faith alone lip service, but they're actually trusting in a nightly prayer of saying, I'm sorry for everything I did today. Saying, I'm sorry for your sins. And so that's where the questions you're going to ask when it sounds like they're saved are, are to rattle the bushes and get them to come out what they really believe. Do you think you have to say you're sorry for your sin? And they, of course, that's what I believe. I believe in Jesus and I say I'm sorry every day. You know, well, boom, I got you. You're trusting in a daily prayer. A misunderstanding of 1 John chapter 1. You know, I confess my sins to be saved every day. And that's not everlasting, you know. And that's where some people, they may think they're not good enough with God and they're not going to make it, but they may not say they're going to lose it. And that's where defining everlasting. Does that, does that help? Yeah, so again, if, if they had three or four questions in a row, they're all 100% right, I would say, okay. Do you think Jesus is God? Yes, I do. Cool, okay. Man, it sounds more and more like you're actually saved. You know, the Bible, and, and then you may just summarize it. And the Bible says, you know, and give them, a, you know, your, your, if you will, like an elevator pitch, what some people would call it, your two-minute salvation plan. The same thing you might leave on somebody's door if they said, well, I don't have any time. Well, let me just tell you this real quick. The Bible says that Jesus came to earth as a man. He was 100% God. He died for all of your sins. And all you have to do is put your trust in him that he's the only way to heaven. Once you believe that, the Bible says you're saved forever. You're once saved, always saved. And once you have that gift of eternal life, you're still going to sin in the body and God will correct you on the earth. But God has made a promise you will never go to hell. And when you say all of those things, they might, it might trigger something. You, know? you may ask them about hell. Would well, you believe hell is real? Yeah. Do you believe your neighbors, if they don't believe in Jesus, they're going to hell? And then they might, well, I don't believe everybody deserves hell. You know, so then they're putting themselves in that category of not actually deserving hell. I would still maybe go into the gospel with them if it's if you're unsure if you don't feel like they're really saved. I've had people like that where I'm telling you, I mean, after five minutes, I feel like I still don't feel you're really saved, but you're giving me the right answers. Well, can I show you what the Bible says? Sure, I might go through it. But again, you know, having the discernment of not wasting your time. Yes, sir. When I run across people that tell me they've already been saved, I like to ask for their testimony. And, okay, well, how old were you? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Right. And, you know, as they share their testimony, the light comes on like, okay, really? Yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah, I got baptized. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of times. I got baptized a bunch. <laughs> uh, uh. I've had several tell me that they got saved in the hospital when uh, they were having this operation and they came to the operation. Oh, yeah. Now, I've heard similar things where you say, how do you know for sure? And they'll say, well, let me tell you, I got in this wreck. Right. And it's like, <laughs> and I'm still here, so that proves, you know, my soul's, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> are you connecting these dots? Yeah, that's a good one, asking for their testimony. Yeah, and that would probably be a good way to follow. If, if it seems like you're getting the, all the right answers, ask for their testimony. And again, they may tell on themselves. I went down and got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I spoke and I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> we got a problem here. <laughs>
I would say, hey, I want you to hear what he heard. Okay, your follow-up should be get mom saved. If you can't, you know, if if the kid gets saved and, and, and mom's still back there, I would, say, I would say, are you sure your mom's asleep? You want to go check and see if she wants to come out? I'd like to share something with her. You know, and thy house, yeah. right? And thy house. That's what happened at this house over here where we have the family that's visiting. Um, I spoke to mom. She seemed to have the right answers. I wasn't 100% settled on her. And she's just kind of answering right. And I said, well, what about your two sons there? Let's talk to them. I've talked to the two sons. They all three prayed. Now, I only counted the son, the oldest son, because he clearly got it. I had a conversation with him the whole time. The younger boy was a little distracted. Mama may have already been saved. So as far as numbers are concerned, I counted as one. Yeah, we had three that called on the name of the Lord. Follow up, two weeks later, we're walking by to finish the block. Her two daughters are standing outside. No mom, no sons. I went and preached to them. They got saved also. They knew they were going to hell. You know, and so Mama was even more excited to hear when she gets home that her daughter's telling her, "Hey, we want to go to this church." We, you know, I mean, think about it. That Mama's Mama's showing up. You know. Yeah. So you know, the Bible says, you know, right before it says, "Forsake not the assembling," it says, "Provoke them unto love and to good works." Provoke is a very strong word. That means like putting your finger in somebody's chest, right? I, I will still use Revelation 1. Well, let me tell you something. You're saved. There's nothing you can do to go to hell. But God expects you to work for Him and He's going to reward you. God expects you to go to church. And do you want God's blessing on your life? Well, yeah. Well, look at this. Look at me. Show, let me show you what it says here. Are you reading your Bible? Are you listening to preaching? Are you, you know, coming to church? Are you obeying the commandments? Those are things you ought to do and God will reward you. He'll bless you now. So, I mean, I, I take that as an opportunity for a mini sermon you know because then yes i'm preaching repent of your sins at the door okay well i'm sure now that i'm sure you're saved man you need to get your life right what are you doing not serving your father you right? know you want to make daddy happy you know use whatever you can to compel them and there's several scriptures you could go to for that but yes absolutely and i tell them i'll i literally say this i'll say okay now i'm going to step on your toes for a minute and what i mean is what i'm saying is i'm going to offend you you're not living right. You need to get right. You need to be in church. You ought to be persuading people to get saved. God expect now you have that same power. You have that same spirit. Yes, I try to use a tie down or a, a confirmation question at the end of every point, just to make sure. Um, some things you can just say, "Do you understand?" And I think they'll tell you if they don't. But most things, I'll like when I read John three sixteen to them. I'll point at everlasting life and, and I'll, while I'm pointing at it, I say, so according to the Bible, what do you have to do to have everlasting, to, to be in heaven with God when you die? And then I move my finger up to the word believe. I'm giving them the answer, but I'm expecting an answer out of them. I'd be quiet until the answer. That's what I was talking about, knowing when to be silent and when to talk. If I just say, so you see it says believe. Okay, next verse. They might still be processing it. And this happens a lot during preaching. Um, some of my best preaching ideas came while Pastor Romero was preaching. He'd read a verse and my mind starts wandering. Like, man, that verse, it's this thing I was thinking about. And he's on another subject and he's already lost me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hard to follow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you think about it. In the same way, when you're talking to somebody at the door, you're introducing new concepts, new doctrine, and there's words that they don't typically use making sure they're understanding it and making sure you're defining it as i said in the beginning can can be the difference in whether they get it or not the way to gauge whether they have the right definition is to ask questions so when you ask them when you show eternal life and you show believe and you get them to feedback okay so instead of me making a mini sermon out of john 3 16 i read it to them and i tell them that that means to go to heaven you have to what's the word believe so now they understand perish and everlasting life. Sometimes you define perish as going to hell, so they understand. People will, will typically tell you if there's something they're held up on, if they're comfortable with you, if they feel like you actually care and you want to teach them. You could tell them you're going to stop by and visit with them, or you could just, I mean, I... I've, I've done it. There was, a, there was a guy and his mom that got saved in Fort Worth and, and uh, I just showed up 
and I ended up getting his neighbor saved. You know, another time I just showed up and there was a Seventh Day Adventist there trying to have a Bible study with him. <laughs> I whipped that guy. I sent him. I mean, he he was mad. He went, uh, you know, <laughs> I ran him off. You know. Well, I mean, I took it seriously. I love that kid. Yeah. I still think about that kid. You know, and I, you know, like like a, I mean, God is jealous over us. Right. And if you love the people that you get saved enough, then you're going to take it seriously, and you're going to you're going to try to protect them. You know, and because he had already told me the Seventh day Adventist had been coming around, and I told him to run him off. And then when I just happened to stop by unannounced and he was there, I ran him off. That guy, I sent him spinning, you know. <laughs> well, no, we don't preach works. Oh, so you don't have to keep the Sabbath to go to heaven? Well, of course you, like, okay, yeah, see, you're a liar. I mean, he didn't know what to, t you know. Here, take your garbage with you, too. They don't want it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, you can tell them, expect me to call you. That's good. You can tell them, expect me to, to follow up, but if you do that, you better do it. Keep your promises. And the, fo the follow-up phone call is the most important. Like I said, carve out half an hour after your traditional soul winning time. If it's Saturday afternoon before you go to lunch, hey man, let's go fellowship and go lunch. We, I can, but first I need to stop by somebody's house. You wanna go with me? I gotta go double check on them and see if, I, if they can come to church tomorrow. Make that a goal and it will change your discipleship. You'll have much more success. Now, we're troubleshooting people, right? We're troubleshooting hearts and their understanding. The Catholics have Bible studies. The Catholics at their churches have Bible studies where people bring free food. And it's a, they, so they, you know, when they go to the Mass, they're always told about it, come check out the Bible study. And in it, they're teaching out of a book that tells you how to debunk a Protestant. Right? They're trained on what to do if you hear this verse. And they're also told that we can't explain, understand the Bible. You need a priest to tell you what the Bible means. So some people have a mental block because they've heard that for too long. Some people have it as just a subtle, latent thing and they might listen to you. Um, I had a lady one time and, and um, I, she brought up Mary. She had a huge idols in the house of whole nine yards. And, and I showed her where it talked about Jesus having brothers and sisters, right? This is the time you answer the fool, lest they be wise in their own con conceit. I said, well, hold on, let's deal with this real quick. Otherwise, we're not getting anywhere. And I showed Jesus clearly had brothers and sisters, Mark chapter 6. Now, and I, I asked her, I said, do you want to believe what the Bible says? Or do you want to believe what the Catholic Church has taught you? And I, I went quiet. I'm sitting here going like this, smiling at her. And she pointed at this hand. And I walked away. She wants to believe the Catholic Church, not the Bible. Well, this is not her authority. If she doesn't believe God wrote the Bible or she can understand the Bible or that I can open it and explain a verse to her, I'm wasting my time. Most Catholics believe in hell. So I would just use hell. You know? Um, you know, use, use 1 John 5.13. You know, maybe use um, Revelation 20.10, Revelation 14.10, things like that to teach the power of hell, the, the severity of hell, Mark 9, things like that. And just, hey, hell, it is everlasting. It is torment. And look, if you'll just give me a few minutes and listen to what I have to say, you can know for sure. But it's up to you. You know, put, put the ball back in their court. Same way I would handle an atheist. I give them an opportunity. Well, do you want to make an educated decision? Think about it, because atheists are usually puffed up in pride. Do you even know what the Bible says? Yeah, I know. What do you think you have to do according to the Bible? And then they don't know. I say, okay, well, look, you don't know what the Bible says you have to do to go to heaven. I'll give you a chance. I'll tell you what it says, and you can choose to believe. Sometimes I'll make the illustration. I mean, if, if you're a Coke guy, but you've never, ever tried Pepsi, how can you say Coke is the best? Wouldn't you want to make an educated decision and try Pepsi? Then say, yeah, no, I like my Coke. And I'll give you that chance right now if you want. Most of them will reject it. Some will hear and then reject it. Some will hear and get saved. Atheists that are, that are that bold in the beginning are difficult, but I've had a lot of people that claim to be atheists that weren't really. They were raised religious. They just think it's a trendy thing to say. Most Catholics don't know what they believe. Most Mormons don't know what they believe, right? If somebody is stuck in their doctrine, you may not get them out, okay? And purgatory obviously is not in the King James Bible. 
They might be able to point to something in the Apocrypha. They may not even know where that's at. You could challenge them and say, you know, well, that's not in the Bible. That's not what God teaches. Can I show you what it says? You're, you know, you may not get anywhere. Um, if you know that they're hung up on purgatory, I would just, in authority, make the statement, purgatory isn't real. The Bible says when you die, you go to one of two places, heaven or hell, and you stay there forever. You know, just deal with it. And they'll either like it or they won't. 